for November 2017 Science Pub presentation entitled Birding Without Borders, an Epic World Big Year. In 2015, bird nerd Noah of Oregon became the first human to see more than half of the planet's bird species in a single year-long round-the-world birding trip. Anything could have happened, and a lot did. He was scourged by blood-sucking leeches, suffered fevers and sleep deprivation, survived airline snafus and car breakdowns and mudslides and torrential floods, skirted war zones, and had the time of his life. Birding on seven continents and carrying only a pack on his back, he enlisted the enthusiastic support of local birders to tick more than 6,000 species, including Adelie penguins of Antarctica, a harpy eagle in Brazil, and spoon-billed sandpiper in Thailand, and a green-breasted pitta in Uganda. He shared the adventure in real time on his daily blog, and now he reveals the inside story. This humorous and inspiring presentation about his epic world big year will leave you with a new appreciation for the birds and birders of the world. And with that, let's welcome Noah. All righty, well, I'm glad to be here. I live just east of Cresswell, actually, up at the end of Bear Creek Road. If you follow Bear Creek Road up to the very end, you hit Will's Road. If you follow Will's Road to the very end, my mom and dad have the last house. They have about 20 acres up there, so not too far down the road. But um, yeah, I, tonight, without really too much further ado, I just want to tell you a few stories about a little adventure I went on in 2015. So you know how when you travel to a foreign country, they always give you this piece of paper just before you arrive. They usually hand these out on the airplane as you're coming in for a landing, and no one ever has a pen to fill the thing out, so there's fights breaking out. But this is an immigration form, and I can say from personal experience that uh, most immigration forms are very similar, and they pretty much all have a spot for occupation. <laughs> I'm not really sure about all of you, but I kind of have a hard time sometimes describing myself and what it is that I do in one word. So I've written all kinds of things on these forms over the years. For a long time, I was just putting writer, which I figured was a nice, suitably vague, all-encompassing term. And that was until April of 2015, when I landed in the country of Jamaica. And I walked up to the immigration counter, and the guy looked at my form, and then he looked me in the eye, and he said, well, what kind of a writer are you? <laughs> I said, uh, uh, I write books. And he said, what kind of books? And I said, I write about birds. <laughs> there was this pause, and he sized me up, this single male, disheveled-looking traveler with no luggage, coming into Jamaica, saying he writes about birds of all things, and he got very suspicious, and he started asking me all these searching questions about who I was and what I do and what my intentions were for the country of Jamaica. <laughs> I just wanted to say, look, I'm on a round-the-world bird-watching binge trying to become the first person to see 5,000 species of birds in one calendar year. I've got 27 hours to see all 29 endemic species of birds on this tiny Caribbean island. My friends are waiting outside on the curb. Will you please just let me through? <laughs> Which I did not say. <laughs> and he eventually let me pass, but I learned my lesson. So on every immigration form I have ever filled out since that moment, I have just written... Bird man. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has ever said a word about it. <laughs> <laughs> How many people saw this movie when it came out? <coughs> yeah, Hollywood flick starring Steve Martin, Owen Wilson, Jack Black, playing bird watchers. This was actually based on a true story of three gentlemen who went around the U.S., in 1998, trying to see as many birds as possible in one year. Actually, the idea of a big year is kind of a tradition among bird watchers, going back to the days of Roger Torrey Peterson in the 1950s did this big trip across the U.S., which he later wrote into a book called Wild America, which I highly recommend if you've never read. 
But it was in that book, literally in a minor footnote in the last chapter, that Mr. Peterson said something like, during my travels in 1953, I observed 573 species of birds, period. And he didn't mean that like a gauntlet being thrown exactly, but other people kind of took it that way and said, well, I could see more birds than that. And so the idea of a big year was born. And the stakes have been escalating and escalating in the decades ever since. Until today, you've got guys like Olaf here did a big year in 2013, again in the US, where he said he had to find every bird in the nude. <laughs> He had all these special rules. He couldn't see the bird and then take his clothes off. He actually be had to be naked when he first spotted the bird for it to catch. He still saw like 600 species of birds by the end of the year, which I think is incredible. They didn't get arrested 12 times by the end of this trip. But in any case, that's kind of where we've come with the big years today, at least on a North American scale. <laughs> and yet, Nobody had ever really taken this concept before and applied it to all of planet Earth, which I thought was interesting because if you look at the world from a bird's eye view, they don't need visas and passports to travel. They don't see our borders at all. They're the most universal creatures we have in many ways. And so I always thought if you're going to do a real big year from a bird's perspective, then you just got to take on the whole planet. There was some precedent for this. In 2008, a British couple named Alan Davies and Ruth Miller did a whole lot of birding trips in one year, and they managed to see 4,341 species of birds by the end of that year, which was good enough for a world record. They wrote this up into a travel log called The Biggest Twitch, which I read and I was quite inspired by. And at the same time, I got to the end, and I guess like all those people who had read Peterson's book in the 50s, I thought, well, I could see more birds than that if I really set my mind to it. <laughs> but I came to this trip through a somewhat more circuitous route. And I think for me it started in the summer of 2011. I set out on a whole different trip and hiked the entire Pacific Crest Trail, which is a 2,650 mile route that goes from the border of Mexico all the way through California, Oregon, and Washington up to Canada. And that took me about four months to hike that trail. That's a whole different story. But I will say that when you spend literally four months wandering through the woods all day, every day, much of that time by yourself, your mind kind of starts to wander as well at some point. And so I started thinking about other crazy ideas and then I thought about big years because I've always thought it would be cool to do one and global big years and thinking about strategy hypothetically could keep me going for days at a time on this trail. So by the time I made it up to Canada that summer, I kind of had this strategy sketched out in the back of my mind, just in case the opportunity should ever happen to come up. <laughs> and then in 2014, I wrote this book called The Thing with Feathers, which is all about bird behavior. And you don't really expect a book of essays about bird behavior to become a bestseller <laughs> exactly. But it kind of was. It was on the New York Times bestseller list, and it was in People Magazine, and The Economist, and <laughs> it just kind of blew up. It's been translated into seven or eight different languages now. And so after that happened, I was like, well, OK. And I sat down, and I wrote a proposal. And I basically said, well, for my next book, <laughs> I want to go around the world and look at birds for a year. And I sent that in kind of laughing about this idea. And the publisher, Houghton Mifflin, came back and they said, yep, sure, sounds like a good idea. In fact, we will give you an advance up front that should be enough to cover the cost of the entire trip. And that's when I suddenly went, oh, crap. <laughs> so. In terms of strategy, I knew from the very beginning that although this was an international trip, I wanted to keep it as local as possible in scale. So I made two rules for myself from the very beginning. I said every bird would have to be seen by me and at least one other person, which would incidentally give me witnesses for all of these sightings, and all of those other people would have to be 
locals living in the same country that I was visiting. So no importing my friends from back home, no hiring international tour guides to show me around. This was really about seeking out fellow like-minded bird nerds in all of these different far-flung places and calling them up and basically saying, hey, I'm doing a big year. Can I come sleep on your couch for a few days? <laughs> and do you want to go hit your local hotspot? So this is just a group of some of the birders that took me out for one morning in northern Borneo when I got there. <laughs> you start adding this up, and by the end of the year, I would have been out in the field with literally hundreds of different birders around the world. I had learned a few lessons about packing light from hiking the PCT, so I decided to apply those to this trip as well. This is pretty much everything I took for an entire year of traveling. I went down to REI in Eugene, and I got myself a 40-liter backpack, which is small enough to put under the seat of any airplane. And I told myself, well, if it doesn't fit, then I guess I don't need it. <laughs> I definitely did need a spotting scope, which you can see there with a tripod to watch birds. And that left just enough room around the edges for an extra pair of underwear and some malaria medication for Africa and some water purification tablets and that kind of thing. That silk thing is a sleeping bag liner that I could crawl up inside and sleep on people's floors when I had to. But other than that, it's really true that the farther you go, the less you really need to take with you along the way. One thing I definitely could not take was reference books. And for a birder, this is kind of a problem. This was a stack of field guides covering just some of the places I planned to visit during the year. I ended up painstakingly going through all of these field guides and either photographing or scanning the identification plates from all of them and loading those as digital files onto my phone and my laptop. So I had this whole reference library with me in the field, which was exquisitely useful. But it was quite a bit of work to do all of that scanning up front before I started. <laughs> and then the fun part, OK, so you've got 365 days to find as many species of birds as possible on planet Earth. Where do you want to go? <laughs> I remember I put down a map on my living room floor, and I started enthusiastically putting down dots of every place I knew I absolutely had to visit. And after a couple hours, I suddenly woke up and realized I had already planned enough travel for about 10 straight years. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to be quite strategic about maximizing diversity, which tends to be concentrated in the tropics. The closer you get to the equator, the more species of birds you'll find. But also not forgetting about endemic birds that you can't find except in one particular spot. So for that reason, islands, especially like Jamaica and Madagascar, became quite important as well. I approach this as a continuous one-way trip, traveling west to east, essentially one long series of one-way plane tickets to get from point to point, which meant that I would not be going back home at all during the year, except for once when I passed through Oregon in the end of May. And I would have new territory to look forward to ahead of me right up until the very last day of the year. So that would help keep the momentum going. And so at midnight on the 1st of January 2015, I found myself on a Russian ship floating off the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula. Because <laughs> I figured if you're going to see the world, then you might as well start at the end of it and work your way back. <laughs> and I really wanted my very first bird of the year to be some type of penguin, which as it turned out, the chin strap penguin went down officially as bird number four on the 1st of January. The first bird I spotted that morning was one called a Cape Petrel, which is this nice Southern Ocean seabird. And I figured that was a good omen for things to come. But I feel like this is kind of how a lot of people see birding and especially this type of birding, where you go out somewhere, you find an awesome bird like this, you get the best possible view you can, you take some photos, you get really excited, you high-five your friend, and then at some point you go, yes, and then you go, check. <laughs> and then you turn around and go off toward the next one and practically forget that this encounter ever even happened. And I guess by starting in Antarctica, which has very few species of birds at all. <laughs> I kind of wanted to make this subtle statement from the beginning that, yeah, 
My goal was to find 5,000 birds by the end of this year. But for me, it wasn't just about the check marks and the numbers. Because you can see, if you just take one step back, it's not just about the bird, but it's about the people that are there with you enjoying this experience. And if you take another step back, you can see that it's also about these amazing places and environments that the birds live in. There are some penguins in this picture, by the way, right there <laughs> for a sense of scale, that massive sea ice in Antarctica. So yeah, it was about the birds. It was about the people, the places, the cultures, the foods, the languages, the adventures, and all the misadventures that go into a trip like this along the way. That's why I wanted to do a big year. However, I think that by the time I left Antarctica a week into the year, I still needed to find 4,990 more species of birds. So I had to kind of hit the ground running when I got up into South America. I think my most wanted bird from the start had to be the harpy eagle, which is the biggest raptor in the Western Hemisphere. Harpy eagles are about three feet tall. Their main diet is monkeys and sloths. An adult harpy eagle can pick a 20-pound howler monkey out of a treetop and carry it back to its nest, which is the size of a Volkswagen bus up in the top of a tree. So that's the kind of bird I knew I just had to find. <laughs> Luckily, when I landed in central Brazil, I met up with these local birders there, a brother and sister, Giuliano and Bianca, a bird researcher and a bird guide. And they came and met me at the airport, and before they really said anything else, they said, we have found an active harpy eagle nest that we're going to go stake out at dawn tomorrow, which they never should have told me because I did not sleep at all that entire night <laughs> until I <f> finally <laughs> rolled out of bed again at about 4.30 a.m. And we went out and watched that nest that I just showed you for about six straight hours and absolutely nothing moved. We saw not a feather. It was getting to be toward lunchtime that day, and I was massively disappointed to miss my most wanted bird practically right out of the starting gate. Didn't seem like such good karma after all. And at the same time, it was hard not to start doing these calculations. You know, technically speaking, a harpy eagle counts the same as a house sparrow. If I wanted to get to 5,000 birds, I needed to average like 13.7 new birds every single day. That's like one new bird every waking hour for the entire year. Every hour I spend here looking for this eagle, I could be off in the forest looking for some ugly endemic bird that would be new for my list. And so I was getting quite frustrated. And Bianca said, I think we should go have some lunch now. And I said, I think you're probably right. And I stood up and I put on my backpack to leave. And of course, that would be the second that the male harpy eagle picked to just swoop right over our heads out of nowhere and land in a tree remarkably inconspicuously for such a huge predator. It is there. If you zoom in, though, you can see this is just a spectacular animal. It's got a massive crest on the top of its head. The talons of a harpy eagle are as long as a grizzly bear's claws. Their feet, if they spread them out, are about the same circumference as a dinner plate. Their legs are as thick as your wrist. This one w had a half of a kawadi in its talons when it flew in, this kind of raccoon-like tropical animal, which you may even be able to make out the tail of hanging down below that branch. So yeah, the harpy eagle, especially after all that effort, definitely went down as one of the top birds of the year on the 30th of January at number 624. <laughs> I continued on my way up through South America, and on Valentine's Day, I was in central Peru. I got higher than I've ever been in my entire life that day. This is at a place called Ticlio Pass, which is at about 16,000 feet above sea level. And I'd started that same morning in Lima, which is at sea level. So by the time this photo was taken, I had a pretty killer altitude headache and stomach ache happening, but <laughs> it was well worth it because the birds in central Peru are spectacular, diverse, with lots of endemics, like the ultimate combination. I plan to spend the next couple of weeks birding around Peru with this gentleman, whose name is Gunnar. Rhymes with lunar, as far as I can tell. He's a Swedish guy who moved to Lima decades ago when Lima was a pretty sketchy place for foreigners to move to just because he wanted to be immersed in the bird life of this amazing country. 
And he's pretty much flourished there ever since. And when I first sent Gunnar an email about my project, asking if he was available, he immediately replied with one sentence in all caps that just said, I am your man, with like <laughs> 10 exclamation points. And when I arrived, I realized he always wears this hat that, again, in all caps, says more birds across the front of it. So I figured he probably was. <laughs> We had some adventures together. We went to the rainforest during the peak of the rainy season, and it never really stopped raining. I got a case of chiggers on my feet, which was quite itchy. This bus hit a tractor on a highway. Incidentally, on the same day, I came down with a severe case of respiratory flu, which was kind of a bummer. Another bus got stuck on a bridge, which delayed us for several hours until they got that sorted out. We had a dead battery in a driving rainstorm in the middle of nowhere on the side of a cliff, and there were flat tires. We got stuck in the mud several times farther up my new road. There was a landslide had taken out the entire road. People had been sitting there for three days cooking their food on campfires waiting for them to clear it and we just squeaked through that one to find out that there was another landslide <laughs> higher up the road which completely blocked us and it didn't even really matter at that point because the agricultural workers had gone on strike and the highlands were shut down so we had to go to plan F I guess at this point. However, we persevered, and Gunnar and I made it up to this patch of elfin cloud forest in central Peru because I wanted to find one species of bird there called the golden-backed mountain tanager, which is super endemic. Pretty much the only place you can see a golden-backed mountain tanager is in the forest within this photograph. And even to get there, Gunnar and I had to leave our accommodation at about 2 o'clock in the morning, drive up this heinous one-lane road hacked into the side of this mountain in the dark to get to the top at about 12,000 feet at dawn to be in position to walk into the forest and look for this bird that was only first described in the 1970s and has not been seen by that many people since. Well, I don't know what the big deal is. Like <laughs> Half an hour, we had this bird pop out of a tree, <laughs> bright yellow, black wings and tail, little blue cap on top of the head, absolutely unmistakably the golden-backed mountain tanager. <laughs> I was quite happy to get kind of an easy bird for once in <laughs> central Peru, so that went down as number 1126. <laughs> but as it turned out, the saga of the golden-backed mountain tanager wasn't quite over yet because when the bird eventually flew off and Gunnar and I retraced our steps to where he had parked our van at the top of this mountain in the half-light of dawn, he'd apparently managed to get it in the one spot where once again it was completely stuck in the mud. <laughs> so... I got in position in the back to push it out, and he got in the driver's seat to drive it out, as we'd become accustomed to. And he turned the key, and then he stuck his head out the window, and he shouted back, Hey, I think we've got another dead battery here, too. <laughs> so I sighed, and I walked up the right side of the van to confer about our situation here. And I just happened to look down and notice that not one but both right tires were also completely flat, apparently from rock punctures on this terrible road that we'd driven up in the dark. So on a remote mountaintop in central Peru, stuck in the mud with a dead battery and two flat tires, incidentally with a plane to catch that same afternoon, I was like, Gunnar, I don't think we're driving out of here this time. I think we just need to start walking at this point and see if we can find some help. And he said, yeah, you're probably right. So I was fine. I just had my little backpack, put that on, started walking down the mountain. No idea how many miles we'd have to go before we found somebody. And Gunnar, meanwhile, he gets his stuff out of the back seat, and he starts walking with two airport wheelie bags of luggage, one dangling from each hand as we're going down this mountainside. <laughs> We made it a couple of miles before we finally came around the corner, thankfully, to find a group of Andean potato farmers, these teenagers who looked up what the expressions you might assume a group of Andean potato farmers would have upon seeing a couple of gringo-looking gentlemen walking down their mountain carrying airport luggage in each hand. <laughs> <laughs> Gunnar did not miss a beat. He put down one of his bags, and then he unzipped it to show that it was completely stuffed full of fresh oranges. And I was like, Gunnar, 
I must weigh like 30 pounds. Were you going to carry these all the way down with us? And he said, yeah, but watch this. And he started tossing the oranges out to all these farmers whose expressions then lit up. All activity ceased. We sat down and had this orange eating powwow. And then they popped back up and said, well, okay, who wants a ride down to the bottom on the back of our dirt bikes? We managed to make it to the airport that afternoon just in time to walk up to the gate and have the attendant look at us with a big smile and say, your flight has been canceled. (laughs) 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 I did eventually make it out of Peru (laughs) with some pretty good birds to show for it, actually. And... Continued on my way up to northwest Ecuador, which is full of beautiful cloud forests like this, because I wanted to make a pilgrimage to visit an angel of peace who lives there. The name of this man is Angel Paz, and he's got quite a compelling story. According to legend, in a former life, this particular angel was a logger, and he was cutting down all the trees on his cloud forest property in Ecuador, when one day a couple of bird watchers happened by and they said, Angel, do you know where we might be able to find a bird called an Andean cock of the rock? (laughs) This crazy neon orange bird with a weird display. And he said, well, yeah, you mean those red birds? I got some out back. I guess I can show you. So they started walking there. But before they reached the spot, At their feet, a little brown bird hopped out of the shrubs into the path, and the birders stopped in their tracks, and they said, on hell, forget about the cocks of the rock. If you can show this little brown bird to visitors, they will actually pay you money to come here because it is so rare. And so they left very happily. And on hell got thinking about this, and he said, well, I know that brown bird. In fact, it likes to follow me around sometimes when I'm cutting down trees. I think it likes to eat the worms that are disturbed in the process. In fact, I've given it a nickname of my own already. I like to call it Maria. Maybe I can make friends with Maria. So he set on this campaign to befriend this little bird on his property. Fast forward several years. I landed on on Angel Paz's property in 2015. He took me out to a particular spot on a trail system behind his house and stopped. He had some worms, you can just see in the lower right-hand corner there, in a leaf, which he put down on a post. And then he cupped his hands around his mouth, and he went, Maria, Maria, venga, venga, venga. (laughs) And sure enough, like 20 seconds later, this little brown bird hops out of the bushes into the trail. This is a bird called a giant ant pitta. It is the largest and one of the rarest of the ant pitta, of of which there is about 50 species in South and Central America. In fact, this is pretty much the only place in the world you can see a giant ant pitta, unless you want to spend months at a time tromping around the cloud forest on your own and hoping you get lucky. So we paid our respects to Maria, this celebrity, but... Angel's kind of honed his act over the past several years. So after Maria ate her worms and then hopped back into the bushes, we continued farther down the trail, and he did the same thing with a yellow-breasted ant pitta that came in for its worms. And then he did the same thing with a chestnut-crowned ant pitta. (laughs) And then he did the same thing with this one, my personal favorite. This is called an ochre-breasted ant pitta. It's about the size and shape of an egg on legs. And... Angel's got his own nicknames for all these birds. This one he likes to call Shakira because it's got a unique habit of twitching its chest from side to side when it gets very, very excited. (laughs) In any case, he's done quite well for himself with this whole ant pitta feeding operation. He's now visited by more than 2,000 birders every year, every one of whom pays an entrance fee to see these ant pittas. By the time I arrived in 2015, he just built himself and his family this beautiful new multiple-story house in the cloud forest with extra rooms upstairs for birders to stay in and hand-carved ant pitta artwork embedded in the walls and... He doesn't speak English. He doesn't have a functioning website. Last time I checked, 
just to get in touch with the guy. You got to know someone who knows him uh, to get there. But I think this is an amazing example of a conservation success story because here's a guy who found that instead of cutting down his forest, he could make a much better living, in fact, kind of become the king of his own area by keeping that forest completely intact. <laughs> I spent about five and a half months just in Latin America, because there's so many birds south of our border, and wound up in mid-May in the interior of northern Mexico. This is the state of Durango, just south of Texas. I was out here in this landscape about 10 p.m. one evening after dark with a birder named Rene from Monterey, looking for nocturnal birds with a spotlight, and we caught some eye shine and snuck up on this little bird sitting on the ground we got so close to it, and yet I still wasn't quite sure what it was because there's species that look very similar. But fortunately, I had my field guide on my phone, so I just held my phone up next to the bird and compared the field marks back and forth with the bird itself and eventually deduced that this bird was a common poor will, which... I'm very familiar with because we have poor whales right here in Oregon as well, and I've seen many of them over my lifetime. But this turned out to be kind of an awesome individual poor whale sighting because, first of all, I had heard before that poor whales sometimes will get a little dazzled by spotlights and flashlights. And so I snuck up on this bird until I was lying flat on my stomach and I reached my right hand out and very gently petted the bird on the back of its head <laughs> while it didn't even move. And then eventually I turned the flashlight off and backed off, and it flew off into the evening, and I realized that this poor will that I had just been petting in northern Mexico was bird number 2,500 on the date of May 16th. That was about the first time I started to realize Oh, if I keep this up, I might even see more than 5,000 birds by the end of this year. Who knew what was possible, really? But I knew I still had quite a few miles to cover, and so I didn't linger. I didn't spend too much time in the U.S. at all, actually. I spent about a week and a half in this country. Two days in South Texas, a couple days in Southeast Arizona, one big day out of Los Angeles. I did come home to Oregon for several days in late May, partly so that I could get a uh, haircut <laughs> while I was passing through. And my last stop in the Western Hemisphere was in the state of New York, where I landed in Ithaca to spend a couple of days with some friends from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology before I continued on my way east. And Tim Lenz, who is a programmer for eBird, the app that I was using to keep track of all my bird sightings in the field, had volunteered to take me around Ithaca for an afternoon looking for common local birds that he sees all the time that I hadn't quite found yet, like upland sandpipers. And I think we were looking that afternoon specifically for an American black duck, <laughs> which is kind of a trash bird, to be honest, in New York, kind of like a mallard is around here. But I hadn't been to New York yet, and I hadn't seen a black duck. And Tim said, I think we can probably find one for you. So we were out there. But about mid-afternoon, he suddenly gets this WhatsApp message on his cell phone and stopped. And I swear, Tim started vibrating instead of the phone. <laughs> I was like, Tim, what is it? And he was like, you're not going to believe this. And I was like, what? And he said, a brown pelican has just been reported from Cayuga Lake. Do you realize how rare? This is like the first inland record of a brown pelican ever from New York. We've got to go see this bird right now so I can get it for my county list. And I said, okay, but Tim, you realize I just saw like 2,000 brown pelicans last week in California where they're supposed to be. I don't need to see this one that's lost. In fact, I really need to find a black duck this afternoon. And you could see this look of horror across his face. <laughs> I knew the feeling, because when rare birds show up around here, I'm often the first one to go look for them. So we compromised on a detour to go look for this pelican. And meanwhile, the reports were coming in with up to the second updates of speed and direction of this wayward pelican as it was cruising up the lakeshore. So we were able to position ourselves in a marina about 90 seconds before we looked off in a certain direction and saw a speck appear on the horizon and then gradually get closer and closer. And sure enough, 
<laughs> pelican out of nowhere flies over our heads and continued on over downtown Ithaca where the reports kept coming in. It's over the farmer's market right now. It's <laughs> over campus right now. This is like the best bird on my campus list ever. You've got to ditch whatever class you're in and go outside and look up. <laughs> I thought this was all highly entertaining. <laughs> We did eventually see a black duck that afternoon for my list. But <laughs> I guess this is a good uh, illustration, though, of how doing a big year on a global scale completely turns the strategy over from doing it on any smaller scale. Even if you take on a whole continent, like those guys in that big year movie did, you are pretty much completely reliant on lost, out-of-range, vagrant birds coming into your area, and you've got to go see them before they can turn around and fly back over the border, and you can no longer count them. But if you do the whole world, you don't have to worry about rare birds. In fact, you are not rewarded for seeing them, because eventually you'll just go to where they normally live and see them in the places where they're supposed to be. And I actually found that kind of refreshing <laughs> about this whole trip. <laughs> I won't say too much about American slash United Airlines, but, um, well, after five and a half months of budget travel all over Latin America, mostly without a hitch, I got handed my worst airline snafu of the year trying to leave the United States. I could not get out of New York. It took me 27 hours delay, which was kind of a bummer because my next planned layover was supposed to be in Iceland where I had planned just over one day to get all my Arctic birds for the year. When the new itinerary came down, they had me landing in Reykjavik at midnight and then taking off again shortly before 7 o'clock a.m. <laughs> I was like, thanks United, there goes Iceland. But I realized that it was June it doesn't get dark in Iceland in the northern summer. So I called up my contact there and I said, Jan, look, here's what happened. I'm landing at midnight. Don't worry, I'll just get a taxi or whatever and go find whatever birds I can. But you know, if you're interested, might be kind of fun to pull an all-nighter with me. What do you think? And he didn't even hesitate. He said, yeah, sounds great. I'll pick you up when you land. And so sure enough, I came down under the midnight sun, and within minutes, Jan and I were scoping for Manx Shearwaters offshore from the airport, and then we raced around the outskirts of Reykjavik for the next couple of hours and racked them up. We had Atlantic puffins at this sea cliff at 3 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the morning. We had whooper swans, 5 o'clock a.m. There were godwits and all kinds of birds, gray lag, goose, arctic tern, black-headed gull. Virtually every bird I saw was new for my list because it was new territory. We ended up shortly before 6 o'clock a.m. at this lagoon just outside of the presidential palace there in the background. And I could just imagine the president of Iceland sleeping in there when this picture was taken, probably dreaming about the amazing list of birds he'd seen from his front yard. Um, but I turned to Jan and I said, I can't thank you enough. Do you realize we have just seen 54 species of birds between midnight and 6 o'clock a.m.? I hope you can at least go home and get some sleep now. And he kind of smiled, and he said, yeah, well, kind of. And I said, what do you mean, kind of? And he said, well, I'm not really from Reykjavik. And I said, what do you mean? Where do you live? And he said, well, my house is actually in northern Iceland, and so I had to drive for about five hours just to come meet you here at the airport. And we've been birding all night, and now I'm going to try to sleep about an hour and a half in my truck before I need to turn around and drive back back home five hours because I need to go back to work today. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of generosity that people will come up with when you have a project like this, and it came up over and over again throughout the year and just completely blew me away every time. So not having slept myself at this point in about 36 straight hours, I took the short connection over to Oslo in central Norway and met my next contact there, a guy named Bjorn, in the Oslo Cemetery, as it turned out, a pretty good birding spot. <laughs> and Bjorn's plan for the next four days 
It was kind of like swapping in fresh horses for the postal service or something because he was not about to let me miss any birds on his home territory. He was very well rested, of course. And his plan was we would travel around central Norway together looking for all these awesome birds, like breeding Lapland long spurs up on the mountain slopes. And then it doesn't really get dark in central Norway either at that time of year. So he just threw a couple of sleeping bags in the back of his truck. And whenever we dropped around dusk, about 11, 1130 p.m., we just put those down and crash out for a couple of hours in the forest and then get up about 1 o'clock a.m. and keep going. And after four more days of that, I was about ready to say, I need to go to a country where it gets dark. I am going to die. This is not sustainable. <laughs> But it was kind of fun to be camping out like this, despite the sleep deprivation, because when I started this big year, I had started a daily blog on the National Audubon Society's website. And when they set that up, Audubon sent a photographer to my house here outside of Cresswell to take a photo to serve as the illustration for the landing page. And this was the picture that that guy came up with. I don't know if you can see, but this photo is pretty much completely fake, okay? I'm sitting there in a sleeping bag reading a copy of my own book <laughs> while I'm spotlighting an owl in the top of that tree that's actually a plastic owl that he's nailed to the top of the tree. This was taken in broad daylight with floodlights to make it look like it was after dark. And So I've been looking at this picture on my homepage every day for the whole year, kind of laughing about it, until... On the third evening in Norway, in this haze of sleep deprivation, Bjorn and I threw down our sleeping bags on a forest road, and just before we passed out unconscious, we heard in the distance the sound of a tawny owl calling from the forest. Bjorn pulled out his phone and played from it a snippet of a tawny owl vocalization, which the owl thought was another owl, so it flew in and landed in a tree right over our heads, and from his sleeping bag, Bjorn spotlighted that tawny owl sitting in the tree <laughs> right above us. So in the end, my fake blog photo actually ended up coming almost 100% true <laughs> in central Norway. <laughs> I didn't spend too long in Europe at all. Again, about a week, week and a half total because there are far more species of birds in the tropics. And so I dropped down into Africa for the next two and a half months. And for me, Africa was the most exotic part of this trip. It was the only continent that I'd never been to before I set out. Obviously, the landscapes change, the people and the cultures qu change quite dramatically as well, and the wildlife change too. All of a sudden, besides birds, there's all these other animals around all the time, which are super cool, but also kind of distracting when you're looking for little brown birds in the grass all the time. It was really cool to see the big cats. I saw lions in several places. I had a face-to-face -face encounter with a leopard in South Africa. I got to watch cheetahs hunting on the Serengeti, like something out of a nature documentary. When you're looking for birds, you see everything else that's out there too because you're looking for things that are so subtle and the obvious things pop out in front of you. But I was really looking for birds. So when people were checking out the elephant at the water hole, I was excited about the fish eagle <laughs> sitting over its head. And when people were looking at the buffalo coming toward us, I was more concerned about the ox pecker <laughs> clinging to that buffalo's back. The birds use the other wildlife as habitat in Africa. It doesn't really happen in other parts of the world. Here's a jacana sitting on top of a hippo's head <laughs> in Uganda. Sometimes the birds will stop traffic themselves. This is a southern ground hornbill crossing the road, again in South Africa. And there's these storks that hang around campgrounds and make kind of a nuisance of themselves. <laughs> but I started noticing something on these safari portions of Africa, and East and South Africa mostly, which was that I'd be out with a group of hardcore birders in a land cruiser or some safari vehicle, and we'd see something really cool and stop to check it out, like, say, this giant kingfisher sitting alongside the road, and, again, be getting really excited and taking photos and high-fiving each other and just going crazy about this. And after about a minute and a half, you would turn around, and there'd be, like, 
15 other safari trucks parked bumper to bumper behind you, all of them wanting to know where the lion was that you so obviously were excited about hidden out there in the grass. And as soon as they realize that you're just looking at some bird, there'd be these expressions of like disappointment and disgust that you'd wasted precious seconds of these people's lives and they'd drive off in a big cloud of dust. It got to be kind of an issue. So we eventually came up with a solution to this problem, which was that one of the local guys had a copy of the field guide with a big picture of a bird on the front cover. And whenever anyone parked behind us, we'd just wave that out the window at them and they'd see it and get the idea that we were looking for birds and usually leave us alone. We called that maneuver flipping him the bird. <laughs> <laughs> Moving onward into Asia, again, things changed quite dramatically. Um, there are a lot of bird watchers in Asia, as it turns out, even more than I would have predicted. Places like India have this thriving subculture of birders, which wasn't really true even or ten, 10 or 20 years ago. This trip would not have been possible in remotely the same way. Birders are connected now with the internet and apps and email, and it's easier to call someone up halfway around the world than it is to get the attention of your roommate in many ways. And so I was able to kind of plug into this network and go around with these posses of birders all over India and other Southeast Asian countries. There are even young birders in Asia. I was amazed. This is Ramit on the left was 24 years old and Taksha on the right was 14 years old. And as far as I knew, could tell the local birds and their behaviors and vocalizations just as well as any of the established experts in that area. So it's quite heartened to see that there's a new generation of bird lovers coming up, even in some of these more far-flung places. It was in South India that I saw this bird. Can you see the bird in this picture? There's actually two birds. There's a gray one in the front and a red one hidden behind it. This is a pair of Sri Lanka frog mouths and the Sri Lanka frog mouth was bird number 4,342, which meant that on the date of September 16th, I had officially passed the existing big year world record, which <laughs> was really cool. Honestly, I hadn't been thinking about the world record too much. My personal goal was to get to 5,000, which was still a ways off. I didn't really see this trip as like trying to beat something that somebody else had done. It was more of a personal quest. But it was kind of cool to suddenly realize you've just done something that no human has ever managed to do before. And if you are going to break a world record of any kind, then... India is definitely the place to do it. I don't know why. Some hugely disproportionate number of Guinness Book of World Records submissions come from India. They have their own Indian Book of Records. There's a third one called the Limca Book of Records for anyone that didn't get into the other two. And so people turned out, when I was looking at these very inanimate sleeping frog mouths, I was being videoed for all the local news channels and newspaper reporters came out. People showed up. This is an actual real religious bishop had apparently come driven 150 kilometers that afternoon just to shake my hand. And he came up and he said, I had a feeling you would break the record today. <laughs> I said, great, but are you a birder? And he said, I have an interest in all living things. <laughs> I said, wonderful. I just loved the enthusiasm. And that continued even as I went onward to other countries all over Southeast Asia, including places like Taiwan. Again, posses of birders turned out to accompany me, in this case, to try to see a celebrity just outside the city of Taipei. These birders took me to see this Siberian crane, which was in fact the first individual Siberian crane ever found in the country of Taiwan. I didn't find it. It had been there for about five months before I arrived, hanging out in this same farmer's field next to a busy highway just outside of city limits. And this bird was a legit 
celebrity by the time I saw it. They'd put up barriers to keep people out of this field. It, the crane was just out there walking around as it had become accustomed to doing. The government had assigned this bird its own 24-hour security guard just to make sure that nothing harmful could happen to it because it was seen as this symbol of Taiwanese Siberian ambassadorship and all of this kind of stuff. And again, this is like Five months after the bird had been there every day, they had signs in multiple languages. There were souvenir stands set up selling crane-themed knickknacks alongside the road, and dozens of photographers lined up to take its picture. They estimated that by this time, approximately 60,000 people had come out just to look at this bird. And they were starting to wonder, well, okay, what should we do with this bird? <laughs> Siberian cranes are endangered. There's only about 2,000 individuals left. They nest in Siberia and should winter in central China. They learn how to migrate from their parents. So this one had evidently gone astray at some point and ended up in Taiwan and didn't know how to make it back home, maybe. So should they catch it and take it back to China? Should they leave it alone? They went back and forth. It didn't really matter because in the end, about a month before I saw it, this crane was observed one morning to get up all on its own and fly out of this field where it had just spent six months. And then it came down later that same evening and took shelter for the night inside an urban subway station in inner Taipei, kind of lost. While again, it was filmed by news trucks and reporters. And then the next morning, it got up again, more purposefully this time, and it was observed to fly in a straight line directly out to sea. and. Nobody really knows if this crane was able to find its flock again or if maybe it's still out there somewhere following a path more all of its own. The last country I planned to visit this year was Australia. And I came down first in the town of Cairns in the Northeast, where again I met a local birder and um, a reporter from the Cairns Post newspaper came out with us that morning to write a story. And he was asking me all these questions. One of his questions was, what bird do you most want to see in Australia? And I said, well, I've never seen a cassowary before. I'd really love to find one. And he said, oh, okay, and he wrote that down. The next morning, the headline in the paper was something like, Birdwatcher wants to break world record with the cassowary in Cairns. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I would like to see a cassowary. <laughs> but about two hours after the paper came out that morning, I got a call on my cell phone because my number was in that article. <laughs> and this guy came on the line and he said, hey, I saw the headline have you seen one of them cassowaries yet? And I said, no. Do you know where I might find one? I don't have a good spot. And he said, well, yeah, I've got a cast and a couple chicks likes to hang out in my backyard. I they just saw them two minutes ago, if you want to come over, I guess. And I said, hold it right there. I'm on my way. And I jumped in my car, drove up to what turned out to be this beautiful property in the wet tropical rainforest above the city of Cairns. And this very nice man took me behind his house where we observed <laughs> this bird that basically looks like a dinosaur. I know technically all birds are the last living lineage of dinosaurs, but this one really looks like one with that big cask on top of its head. This was a male. It's always the father that takes care of the two chicks. Cassowaries are big. They're the third biggest bird in the world after the ostrich and the emu, about as tall as I am. And they have this somewhat fearsome reputation of being the most dangerous bird in the world because technically I think they still are the only bird that's ever directly killed a human being by blunt force trauma. If they kick you hard enough in the stomach, they can actually disembowel you. And they're kind of aggressive sometimes. But this one seems super friendly, and so I didn't have a big issue with hanging out with it like this for about an hour. One of the coolest experiences I had. Least Christmassy Christmas I think I've ever spent in my entire life in <laughs> Southwest Australia. This was the only Christmas tree I saw all day on December 25th, several hundred kilometers from Perth in the middle of nowhere. It was about 95 degrees. In fact, I didn't see another human being all day long on Christmas, except for a guy named Frank from Perth, who had volunteered to spend his whole holiday bird watching with me in the middle of nowhere, which I was very grateful for. <laughs> but, you know, 
if you're in the right spirit and frame of mind, then any tree can be a Christmas tree on December 25th. So I was quite happy to see this one that had a green and red bird in it to celebrate the holiday. This one is called a Mulga parrot. And on the 25th of December, the Mulga parrot was bird number 5,959. So that afternoon, we were driving back to Frank's house. And I said, Frank, look, I've already exceeded my original goal by 959 species. It's all gravy at this point, really. But it would be criminal to come so close to 6,000 and not quite get there. How are we going to find 41 more birds in the next few days before New Year? So we stayed up hours into the night that evening, painstakingly making a list of every bird anywhere in Australia that I had not yet found, and eventually deduced that it was not <laughs> possible. <laughs> Maybe if I had a few weeks, but not in a few days. The distances were just too big. So then I said, well, Frank, it's been wonderful birding with you over the holidays, but uh, where in the world can I go to find 41 more birds? I've only got one shot at this. And fortunately, eBird, this database I was keeping track of my sightings with, had just introduced a new feature in 2015 called Target Species, which will filter all of the observations of birds for any region of the world against your own personal list and export that in descending order of frequency of encounters in the field. So it will literally calculate to the sixth decimal point how many species of birds you can expect to find anywhere. So I ran that for a whole bunch of different places and eventually calculated that the one place I could kind of go back to that I hadn't really done properly the first time around was the far northeast corner of India, way up there in the eastern Himalaya, up by the Chinese border. So some fancy footwork with visas and booking international plane tickets on Christmas Day for the following morning. <laughs> 24 hours after spending a very hot Christmas in the Australian outback, I came down at 8,000 feet in the Himalaya in the dead of winter where it was freezing cold. I met, again, these gung-ho, hardcore, young Indian birders. That's Ramit, again, on the right, who I showed you earlier. I'd seen a couple months before. He called a couple of his friends in that area, and they were dedicated to going hard the last couple of days to try to find these last 41 species. We did see this bird. Can you see the bird in this picture? <laughs> it is there, right there. <laughs> Okay, this is a horrible photo of a very good bird called a yellow-rumped honey guide, which only really lives in that northeast Indian immediate region in a certain narrow elevational range, almost always next to vertical cliff faces like this that also have an active honeybee hive attached. <laughs> so quite specific habitat for the yellow-rumped honey guide. But when we spotted this bird, I was literally jumping up and down in the road because the Yellow Rump Honey Guide on the 29th of December <laughs> was bird number <laughs> 6,000. <laughs> of course, I still had two more days, so I <laughs> didn't quite stop there. The very last bird I saw on December 31st was this little owl called an Oriental Bay Owl at about 11 p.m. just before New Year. I'd snapped this photo, and Ramit was standing next to me, and he turned around and he said, do you realize how rare this bird is around here? And I said, no, how rare? And he said, well, as far as I know, this is the first photograph ever taken of this species anywhere in this country. <laughs> and I said, Okay, I think that's my last bird. The big year <laughs> is a wrap. <laughs> By the time the dust settled, I'd visited 41 different countries on all seven continents. I flew just about exactly 100,000 miles. I think it was 100,514 to be exact, which might sound like a lot. It's about the same as four round trips from here to Australia. So 
It averaged out to maybe one flight every three or four days. Each of those connections was only one or two hours at the most to get to the next spot. So I never had jet lag. I booked all of those connections at night to preserve my daylight hours. So I didn't really spend that much of this year in airports, somewhat counterintuitively. I spent about $60,000 on the whole trip, all expenses included, all the gear, food, accommodation, guides, travel, everything. Again, that might sound like a lot, might sound like not so much. It, to me, $10 per bird seemed like a pretty small price to pay. <laughs> and I guess it just goes to show that travel, like many other things, is a priority. Would you rather have a nice SUV in your driveway, or would you rather go to 41 countries? These are literally the choices that we make every day, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. I know I said at the beginning that it wasn't all just about the numbers. The numbers themselves were maybe even more fleeting than I'd first imagined. I ended up the year officially with 6,042 species of birds, about 60% of all the birds in the world, which beat the existing record by about 1,700 species. The second I finished my big year, the beginning of 2016, another young man from the Netherlands named Arjan, two months younger than I am, my Dutch twin, I suppose, <laughs> set out on his own round the world bird watching trip, largely using this map as a blueprint and tweaking a couple things here and there, learning from my mistakes in terms of strategy and ended up last year, 2016, even seeing a couple hundred more birds than I did. So right away, my world big year record was broken, which I think is quite entertaining, actually. <laughs> more power to him and to anyone else who takes on this challenge in coming years and hopefully finds ways to take it in new directions. Um, I'm interested to see where it goes. Also, at the same time, scientists have been redefining what our idea of a species of bird even is in recent years. The global bird list has been going up by about 1% per year. Inflation, species inflation, if you want to call it that, very steadily for the past decade or so, and it shows no sign of slowing down. In fact, there was a paper that came out just within the past year that said with the new DNA methods that we're using to define bird species these days, instead of the 10,500 or so recognized birds in the world, they think there should be something more like 18,000. <laughs> so the splits are not going to stop anytime soon. And I guess I can just sit in my armchair and tick them off as I find all these lifers fr from home as they're newly minted by scientists. <laughs> but no, it, of course, th the thing that I came away from this trip the most was just all of the new friendships and connections and characters and people that I met along this journey. I literally went birding with hundreds of different people that I'd never known before from all of these different places, and many more were following along on the web. I started that blog mostly as a way to tell my mom and dad that I wasn't quite dead yet. <laughs> and by the end, it was getting 10 or 20,000 visits every day. And so the interest in this trip blossomed in a way that I hadn't quite predicted from the start. And so I guess if I can help spread that inspiration of birds as far and wide into the farthest and not so far reaches of this planet as humanly possible, then that is definitely the best possible outcome of all. Thanks so much. <laughs> We've got time for a couple of quick questions, yeah? How come I did not go to the Soviet Union or Russia or really Northeast Asia at all? There's not enough endemic birds up there. I could have gone to Japan and picked up a few more. I could have picked up a couple more in Siberia, which I'd love to travel to one day just for the experience. There's a lot of places you work down the list, but a year is a very short time, as it turns out, and so I had to be pretty strategic about the places I included. If I were to do it again, I could probably squeeze out a few more birds here and there. But again, it, it wasn't all just for the numbers. It was for the adventure as well. So one day, I hope that I can go back to uh, Mongolia. I've never been to. I'd love to visit. 
Cuba. We were just talking about I'd love to visit. Guyana is on my top list now. Ethiopia and Namibia. Those are probably the top places that I missed during this trip that I'd like to go to next. <laughs> where the other person tweaked it. Yeah, I have not met Aryan yet. He um, lives across the pond from us. I've corresponded with him a little bit. He sent me an email when he set out that basically said, well, I'm going to break your record this year. <laughs> I said, well, okay, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> but um, I'm sure he'd be a great, great one to go birding with if I ever get over to the Netherlands. Yeah. Could you have a handicapping system that <laughs> rewarded you for more rare birds and adventurous destinations, maybe? And I don't know. I think we should invent one. <laughs> I know a fr I have a friend in Burns in Eastern Oregon who keeps a yard list that's very competitive with his neighbors. And he has a point system. So if a bird just flies over his yard, it's one point. If it lands on something in his yard, it's two points. If it comes to his feeder, it's three points. If it nests in his yard, it's four points. If he removes an introduced species, that's a bonus point. <laughs> He can see the sewage ponds a couple of miles from his house because he's up on a slope with a spotting scope, but he can't identify the birds on them. But he has his wife go out to the sewage ponds while he's sitting in his yard, <laughs> and she tells him, okay, the duck in the northeast corner of the north pond is a bufflehead, and he checks that off on his yard list. So <laughs> these things can get quite competitive. <laughs> Any other quick questions? Yep. What's next? Well, I guess I should note that I have written a book about this whole thing. It's called Birding Without Borders. It just came out in October last month, so it's hot off the presses. It's all these stories and narratives about traveling the world, obviously. I've got some copies over here. If you want a signed one, come see me after class or $25. I'd be happy to give it to you. And meanwhile, on to more adventures. I, you know, How do you follow up a trip like this? I'm not going to do another big year. Um, I'm now working on another book with National Geographic, a photo essay book with one of their photographers named Joel Sartori, so that should come out sometime next year. Meanwhile, I'm heading to Antarctica in a week and a half for another season with a cruise expedition company called Clark that I've worked for for the past four or five years in Antarctica in the southern summer and Svalbard in the Norwegian Arctic in the northern summer. And in between, I work for Birding Magazine as an editor and work on other trips and projects. And so these days, I really can call myself a full-time bird nerd <laughs> and uh, really own it. I'm, I'm proud of that fact. And um, anyway, thank you all for coming. If you've got more questions, just come find me. I'll be around. <laughs>